Hi, I'm Jack Kurtzman. I'm the manager here at Hyde Street Studios. Uh, Hyde Street Studios have been in business since 1980, so 41 years uh, under the ownership of Michael Ward. And uh, 11 years before that, it opened in 1969 as a recording studio. Uh, it was called Wally Hyder Studios. So back in those days, the San Francisco music scene was really happening. And uh, that's when you had uh, Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Santana, uh, Herbie Hancock, um, tons of other uh, influential musicians, you know, recording in these studios. So that was a really kind of a special place in, in San Francisco music history. Uh, and then since 1980, since Michael Ward uh, started Hyde Street Studios here, uh, a lot of other music scenes have come through, uh, notably the punk rock scene uh, with Dead Kennedys recording records here and Green Day, uh, and the hip hop scene with uh, Tupac Shakur recording here, uh, Digital Underground, Hieroglyphics. Uh, and then, uh, you know, more recently, we've done a lot of other uh, big records, um, you know, had a lot of other notable artists in here. so. Everyone from uh, One Republic to uh, Cake and Train, um, Sun Kill Moon, um, tons of others. So, yeah, the studio started, uh, like I said, in 1980. So Michael Ward uh, at that time uh, just wanted a place to record his band. So he started the studio here with some partners. Uh, his partners were, uh, you know, had their own recording studio, smaller spaces. Uh, so they kind of moved the whole operation here, and uh, after a few years, Michael was the only one uh, remaining, so he's solely owned it since uh, 1984. The equipment here is, you know, fantastic. Uh, you know, we've got a ton of great outboard gear here, as you can see, and uh, we've got the, uh, the Neve console here. So a lot of people might say, like, you know, the Neve console is definitely like a main feature of the studio that uh, draws a lot of engineers and, and artists to work here from all over the world. Uh, it's a very kind of sought after vintage piece of gear. Um, but I, I would say the, the main thing that, uh, you know, is key to our success is the community of uh, engineers and musicians that record here. Uh, we've got a really fantastic group of engineers that work in this studio. Uh, we've got another uh, number of other rooms in the building uh, where we have engineers and audio professionals working on everything from like audio for films to video games and other like smaller music production spaces. So. It's really a nice uh, community and good atmosphere here. Yeah, so COVID shut us down for uh, a few months uh, and it was it was tough because we still had to pay rent, of course, uh, on this building. And, uh, you know, that's that's a considerable amount of money. So it definitely threatened us, you know, existentially, uh, you know, the survival of this business. Um, so that was uh, that was really tough to get through and get over. Um, but we managed and, uh, you know, once we reopened, it was slow. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, early on coming back, you know, after we were able to reopen uh, with the uh, the rest of the entertainment industry. Uh, it was a lot of like um, single vocals and a lot of just like single, uh, you know, musicians. Uh, the kind of uh, ensembles that we were recording, that kind of work was just non-existent. Hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, some of that started to come back recently. So that's that's been good and, uh, you know, picking up and getting back to close to normal where we were pre-COVID. Uh, we reinvented a bit coming out of COVID. We um, started leaning more into audiobook recording, podcasts, uh, voiceovers, um, that kind of commercial spoken voice recording stuff, uh, which has never been, uh, you know, a pillar of this studio. Um, but we started kind of advertising that more, put it on our website um, just to kind of fill out our calendar. Um, Whereas pre-COVID, we never really had to take too much of that work. Um, I think uh, preferentially, you know, the engineers here would rather work on music, but, uh, but that works, you know, that's good money too. So. The competition uh, in the Bay Area, um, a lot of that's gone away. Um, you know, it's uh, unfortunate for the music scene as a whole, but uh, we've lost studios like uh, Fantasy, uh, Fault Line, um, Tiny Telephone, um, their San Francisco location, that is, and Studio Trilogy, uh, Record Plant, uh, years before that. So there's a lot less competition in, in SF than there used to be. Uh, so that positions us well. Um, we were super busy before COVID hit, and I expect to get back there pretty quickly. We're, all, we're almost there, if you like. So. <laughs>
All right, can you tell me your name and your business's name and what you guys do here? Uh, my name is Achilles Guerrero, and um, this is Flywood Coffee. It's my business, and what we do here is just roast coffee and, and also serve coffee, brew coffee. And how long have you guys been in business? We opened uh, in 2012. And why did you guys start? Why? Well, I, my whole family is into the coffee business here in the city, and um, it's just what I was born to do. I was born in a coffee farm in Nicaragua, and, uh, so I know, you know you can say I know a lot about coffee on that end and in this in the retail end too. Um, what is your most important feature of the coffee? Feature? Uh, the coffee. Um, so I'll say all around coffee, there's not one in specific, like pour over itself is good, and, and cold brew, we have a really good cold brew, and, and our espresso drink, so just coffee yeah. as well. Um, how has COVID impacted your business? It has impacted, um, you know, we were, we were able to stay open, so that helped out a lot, a lot of businesses closed, so we feel blessed and fortunate that we were not forced to close. And uh, so it, it hurts a little bit because we can't have you know people in here. But at the same time, it could be worse. And what does the future look like for your business? I we were able to open uh, across the street a, a kiosk during the pandemic. So I think uh, it looks good. If we were able to do that, I think we could. You could definitely survive when, when everything comes back to normal. Perfect. That's all of us. Yes. So, can you please tell me your name, your business, and what you do here? My name is Naomi Silfman. The name of the business is Mendel's. I own this business, and so I do whatever needs to be done, whenever it needs to be done. Great. How long have you guys been in business, and why did you guys start? So I am the third generation owner. It was originally started by my grandparents in 1968, taken over by my aunt. I've been involved since 91 and took over officially in 2013. The business was originally open just because there was a need for art supplies. The 60s were a very creative time. And so my grandparents put in art supplies and then also fabrics. Well, what has been the most important feature of your business and how has it kept you growing? I think the most important feature is that my grandparents believed in owning property, and so they bought this building in 1968. And that's allowed us to weather the various storms that have come through San Francisco. The other part is that we are very nimble. And so as things change within the industry, as people want to do other types of crafts, we're able to switch on a dime and adjust what we sell. Okay. How has COVID impacted your business and what have you guys done to work around it? Initially, of course, it was in a lockdown and nobody was coming out. That was a huge issue. After that, we were allowed to offer curbside, but honestly, for what we do, curbside is difficult. When people want to be creative and want to choose paints for a painting, often they want to be able to look at them all side by side. It's not like when you're going to make a recipe and you can order all of the items that you need ahead of time. So curbside for us was really difficult. We did what we could. And honestly, we were just patient so that we could get to the other side when people could be allowed to come back in and shop. Great. And what does the future look like for Mendel's? I, there's no question in my mind that the future is bright. We're going to continue adapting and changing. San Francisco has always been a really creative city. People like to do art, people like to do crafts, and at some point we'll get back the tourists and we'll just keep doing what we do in the hate. Awesome, thank you so much. Hi, my name is Derek Nakata. I'm a student at the University of San Francisco. I'm a junior, and last semester I took Professor Hudson's family business course where we researched the different corridors of San Francisco, doing research on family businesses and more. So my business and my street was the Fillmore, and what I had discovered was Miyako, which is a black-owned, one of the last ice cream parlors on that block. 
Um, it's run by Tom Bennett. It's been around for around 28 years. It's an amazing spot. Tom is a super cool guy. Um, obviously, being in an ice cream shop during COVID is a little bit tough, um, especially towards the beginning. But he's been able to do. He's been able to survive. And so I really did not know much about the Fillmore Corridor, uh, much less Miyako, and learning a lot about my roots. I mean, I'm personally I'm Japanese, so understanding that the Fillmore had a lot of Japanese people before um, the internment and it was African American primarily before the urban renewal um, slash gentrification um, and being able to learn that history was really important for me and especially understanding how Tom has been able to stay open throughout the last 28 years and thrive has been, has been really great as well you know he adds that that personal touch that a family business can do that maybe a chain cannot um, just like that one-to-one -one interaction that's really personal, you know, because he's really close to the business, he's really experienced. Understanding the roots of the Fillmore District and how it's shaped the community, especially something as far as Miyako, like the name that Tom decided was really just focused on Japanese people during a time when it was primarily African American. So having that story and having the understanding of how the community has shaped and how Tom has been there for 20 years and it's almost shaped around him, you know, that's just something that's like really important and I I personally thought that that was really powerful. Just understanding and the concept of doing your own research to figure out more about the family businesses that you see every day that you normally don't question. Like I said, even something as little as buying an ice cream cone or just stopping by and saying hello can make a really big difference. So truthfully, one of the most important things that you can do is just to be curious. Just think about your impact and what you can do to help a family business. And really, it does not take much. It really does not, you know, I thought maybe, oh, you have to donate, different stuff like that. It's really not like that. For example, at Miyako, just buy some ice cream, buy some candy. When you stop by, just grab something, you know, even something as simple as resharing. You don't even have to be there in person, just reshare, you know, spread awareness. Different stuff like that can make a huge difference. So I definitely would like to push and encourage anybody watching this to please do that whenever you can. Do your research, learn more about the business maybe make a connection with the owner, the employees, it makes a really big difference. And I think that's something that goes unnoticed a lot, but it does. So just keep that in mind. First question, tell us your name, your business, and what you do. Uh, I'm Shelly Baker. Uh, I work at Padre Cito and I am a front of house manager. Uh, my name is Max Houston. I also work at Plantacito, and I'm one of the other front of house managers. Cool. How long have you been in the business, and how and why did you get it started? Uh, I've been in the service industry for almost 10 years now, uh, and I've been with Plantacito since February 2018. Um, and I choose to work in this industry because it is vibrant, fast-paced, and uh, provides financially. Uh, I've been in it, I can't, don't know exact date, but probably like three years now, a little bit before when Shelly started. Uh, I chose to be in this business just because oh, I have about like 10 years experience too also. Uh, I like dealing with people kind of and always like interacting with others. Uh, like, like she said, it does pay financially and it's kind of fun to just like really figure out uh, how a restaurant works. Uh, okay, so what's been the most important feature of your business that has kept you growing? I think that the most important feature is uh, the connection to the community that we have at the restaurant. Um, Padre Cito is located in Coal Valley, which is a small neighborhood and it's tight knit. So uh, our relationship with our guests is very personal. Uh, so that's one thing that has uh, kept the restaurant successful. And as far as my own personal growth, it's the problem solving skills that come with it because things can always go wrong at any time, but you need to keep it moving. Um, yeah, I would say the same, not to copy it, but because it's Coal Valley is so tiny, it's like almost half of our business is through regulars that are coming at least once a week. Uh, building those relationships, I feel like has helped the restaurant grow for sure because people like know who they're coming to see in this restaurant. We try to keep a tight staff until recently we had to hire new people because of COVID and people were leaving or moving out of town. Uh, for me, I would say just like learning how like a business operates, like all the numbers and just kind of money and stuff and like cost, and cost analysts and stuff like that. 
which I never thought about when I was younger, like just being like a bus boy. But now that we're on the management staff, you kind of actually have to pay attention to that part. And it makes you, like she said, grow better as they kind of just, a, I guess, a manager, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How did COVID impact your business and did you have to reinvent it in any way? So COVID led to the a full shutdown of Fadrecito for several months, which obviously was devastating, not only for the owner, but for all of the staff, both front of house and back of house, because everybody was out of a job. Um, and it did lead to kind of a rebirth as we tried to navigate how we were going to keep making enough money to keep it afloat. So that started with the to-go business and to go is actually been like the forefront. It's been really busy. So we um, started doing to go cocktails as well. So that's been really popular. Uh, people are like really eager to get those kind of craft cocktails to go also. Um, and the limited capacity seating has also been a challenge because you need to make sure that everybody's being safe. Um, the plexiglass dividers definitely help. Uh, and we, I mean, the restaurant's getting filled every night. Um, so the main, the main really issue with the COVID was we lost half of our restaurant, like seating mm -hmm. after, even after we reopened. Cause it's technically, I think now it's, you can go up to like 50% maybe. Yeah. But we're still kind of operating, I'd say around like 30 to 40%. So like we'll, It'll be a busy week all week, but the numbers are never the same because we're not seating as many people. Like yeah. our bar is still shut down because we're trying to figure out like how to make it work where they can sit at the bar. Mm -hmm. Just because we're probably like the glass that we're gonna have to build. Um, we've had to build a whole new like system of running like every night. It wasn't like the same because we're a little bit we're pretty much like one person less than we used to be every night. Mm -hmm. So when it's crazy busy, we'll have to like be running around like crazy, but obviously it's worth it in the end. But uh, yeah, let's go cocktails are good. The food, the way we uh, changed how you can order food, like instead of ordering through DoorDash or one of those other sites that take a percentage from the restaurant, we've made our own like online way of ordering and then they can just come pick it up. And we don't get like charged from DoorDash or stuff like that, so it's more money for the, for the restaurant. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, what does the future of your business look like? Uh, I think that the future looks uh, bright, hopeful, busy, and we're slowly, I think, coming towards what we call like a new normal. And it's there's overall kind of a sense in San Francisco and with our regulars coming in of dissipating anxiety and fear. And I think that's mainly to do with the fact that vaccines are becoming more readily available. Um, and with the grand reopening of San Francisco scheduled to happen June 15th, I do think that the it will be fully open. And we may not look exactly the way we did, you know, in previous times, but it will be, it'll be great. <laughs> uh, I agree. I think the future is bright. I've been noticing lately a lot of people are just going out because they're like, they're so sick of being at home. Yeah. Like, we'll have days where it was like raining and people are like, we'll still sit outside in the rain and eat and like, just spend <laughs> money because they've been locked in their whole while. Uh, especially because if we are fully open, that just means more people. That means more money for the restaurant, which means like we can do more things and hopefully like add new dishes like we've been planning and stuff like that. So I think with the reopening, I think it's going to be probably for the first few months, probably busier than we've ever been, like <laughs> even before now. Yeah. And then maybe it'll kind of slow down a little bit, but it's also very seasonal. It's like in the summer, we'll be busy no matter what. Yeah. When it's cold and windy, even though lately people don't care that they're still <laughs> going out because we have heaters and all that stuff. But yeah, I think it should be a good future. It's looking bright. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Well, thank you guys for your responses and for doing this. And yeah, hopefully that it, it will be bright. It will be good. <laughs> we'll see. Only time will tell. Good afternoon. Could you tell us your name, what your business is, and what you do? My name is Herman Jones. Uh, my business is Jones Protective Services, and we're a security and investigative service. I might add we also have other services which are 
fingerprinting and, and notary. How long have you been in business? I have been in business now 17 years. Uh, so we just had our birthday on, in March. And uh, where are you located? We're at 275 Fifth Street, which is the uh, Renaissance Entrepreneurial Building. And what city is that in? City and County of San Francisco. Okay. And anything in your background that set you up for the security business? Well, uh, the obvious is I was a police officer in the city and county of San Francisco for 30 years. Um, I worked in multiple assignments, and so it positioned me to take on a business uh, kind of hitting the ground uh, running. Okay. And how about any military service? No military service at all. Okay. Other than being a Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> that counts. Um, how have things been during the pandemic over the past year or so for your business? Well, it's an obvious challenge. Uh, everyone was frightened and uh, without a real script on how to respond to uh, a, a pandemic this large and that was worldwide. Uh, we incrementally uh, began to put together a plan. Much of it uh, was through the loyalty of my employees who were willing to come in. Uh, we were immediately identified as an essential service and so we were able to actually come to work but I can't get the work done if people don't come to work and they have a fear but people did and um, we uh, provided services to uh, our our different clients many of them are uh, impoverished themselves and working in, uh, in uh, homeless uh, facilities and uh, the like, and also other challenging areas. So they needed security and we were able to provide that. Uh, our other business as well, uh, the, the live scan, the fingerprinting, it's still an essential service and uh, people needed it uh, to move their lives along and as well as notary, it was the same scenario. Mm -hmm. Did your business contract during this period of the pandemic? Initially it did. Uh, people, um, obviously everything shut down. Even we were only coming to to work once, a, uh, at least the administration piece of it, we're only coming to work once a week because we just didn't know. Our building that we were actually occupying for administrative purposes was closed. And uh, so we actually snuck in a couple of times uh, in order just to be able to pay our employees and to deal with the administrative responsibilities associated with the business. Uh, but again, I guess week by week, and in some cases, day by day, things change and evolve to allow us to do our job comfortably. Um, uh, interestingly enough, we were probably the only people in the building uh, for maybe a couple of weeks and subsequently were joined by other uh, businesses here in this building. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you tell us a little bit more about how many employees you have? We have, uh, it, that expands and contracts based upon um, certainly uh, our our uh, client base. We have 22 employees, including our administrative people. Uh, we have a variety of assignments around the city and county. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit more about why Jones Security Services are so essential? What what made this business essential in the middle of a pandemic? Well, above the fact that we think we're the best, uh, I, I believe that uh, we provide a service. Uh, security is much like a relationship. I mean, people over time uh, become familiar with the, the service that we provide. They become familiar with the people who are providing them um, that are not me necessarily, but the, the employee who is on the site. And uh, that creates a sense of uh, predictability and not to mention comfort and safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the people you hire to actually perform the security functions who are on site at the homeless shelters or the soup kitchens or the businesses that need security on location, um, is there any particular demographic or profile that, that you're looking for to assist? Or is it uh, just pretty much anyone who walks in off the street? Well, uh, it, it, it often start, time starts with anyone walks off the street. Why? Because this is a, as I have shared with others, this is kind of a gateway opportunity for employment. Many of our employees don't necessarily enjoy the benefit of having a, a high school diploma or even a, a GED, uh, but they do have good common sense and they have uh, good people skills. And, you know, that has value in, in terms of what it is that we do. I do have a profile. I do, um, I'm seeking people who are people 
persons who are dutiful, who are honest. And uh, those things are uh, in many ways accomplished through the testing that they go through to become security guards. But, you know, uh, invariably, every person who has employees has to go through what we call a smell test. And so, you know, yes, I, I, I kind of, through our interview process, get a sense of the person, get a sense of their background. And uh, ultimately, that, that, is, uh, that feeds into my selection process. Obviously, availability, you know, there, um, if there's any physical rigors that are involved, you know, those are consideration. But uh, invariably, it starts with the person that comes off the street. Yeah. So it sounds like you're essential not only because security services were a real need during the pandemic, but also because you're providing gateway employment for essential workers. For sure. For sure. And um, as you had maybe alluded to, some people's businesses closed down. So some people were uh, out of work overnight. Yeah. And yet they had families and they had obligations that they had to meet. And uh, many of them became security guards, you know, because yeah. we are essential service. Uh, it is, it, you know, you're not going to get rich <laughs> being a security guard. But, uh, and I've expressed this to you in the past, that uh, some of our uh, employees have come in, they've worked as security guards, and that has been a platform for them to go to other jobs, uh, to f- uh, find their own client base, and in some cases start their own businesses. Yeah. So essential in at least two fundamental ways is Jones Protective Service. So now that you've survived this pandemic, more than survived, I think is fair to say. Survival is a good word. Okay. Uh, it, it implies that it's it, it takes work and we have to work on it uh, every day. Okay. So what do you see for the future now that uh, you've gotten to this point, pandemic notwithstanding? I'm optimistic, you know, and the reason why is because we are essential service. We've been out there, we've performed. Uh, I've been taught something by this experience is that we're resilient and, uh, you know, we can do. And I have people now who have gone through this with me and they can do people. We're, we bonded together in that respect. I believe our brand will grow as, as a result of that. Uh, I think the spirit that goes along with being an employee in Jones Protective Services will, will be uh, uh shared with others and, and then of course the clients know that we're, we're there we're, we're dutiful we, we do the job and again I, I might add we'd have people in soup kitchens but we also have clients who who live in very high-end uh, living quarters and uh, our people have been there all the time and uh, we've gotten quite a few uh, kudos in terms of our responsiveness and our dutifulness so you work really at all ends of the economic spectrum in terms of security needs Without a doubt. And uh, as I say, what happens all too often is, is that uh, when my employees go there and they do the job, they form a relationship with the people. It is a people business. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to find good people to work at these sites and to form relationships that embellish the brand of Jones Protective Services. And so would you say that because it's a relationship business, being able to maintain those relationships is what is going to launch you into the future post-pandemic? I, I think that's what sustains us, and I hope that does bring us into the future. Thank you very much, Herman Jones of Jones Protective Services. Jones Protective Services.